dyskutowali na temat pamięci totalitaryzmu. We are going to be discussing the totalitarian aspect of memory and the asymmetries, the asymmetries of memory in the East and West and the Holocaust in the context. We have a number of uh, excellent university teachers as part of the panel on my left. Professor Jarosław Hrycak from Lviv. He works at the Lviv University and he is also the head of the Department of the Ukrainian History at the Ukrainian Catholic University in Lviv. He wrote a book recently published in Poland as well, Prophet in His Own Land, Franco and His Ukraine. And uh, also he wrote a history of the Ukraine from the 18th century to contemporary times. Dr. Heiko Pavo, he is the director of Baltic Studies at the University in Tartu. He focuses on international relations, studies on memory, and also systemic transformation. Professor Andrzej Nowak, I believe the best known professor in this lecture hall. He is the um, a teacher at the Jagiellonian University. He's a professor of the Polish Academy of Sciences. He published a number of uh, books on the history of Russia and imperial studies, specifically in the um, context of Russian imperial experience. Most recently, he also published a book on Polish disputes concerning identity and uh, historic memory. Strache uh, ilache or fears and poles, transitions to Polish memory. And uh, his most recent endeavor is the history of Poland, the first volume of which has been published already, a very original and personal synthesis of Polish history. We will probably be hearing from everybody who heard about it shortly. Our next guest, Peter Lagru of the pre-university in Brussels. He focuses primarily on uh, the legacy of Nazi occupation, and such is also the title of his book, Legacy of Nazi Occupation, Patriotic Memory and National and National Recovery in Western Europe, 1945-1965. He is an expert, a specialist in the area of Nazi occupation and European memory in terms of West European history. On my far right, Professor Jan Kubik. Today, he teaches at uh, Rutgers in the United States, whereas he is a graduate of the Jagiellonian University. He is the author of many books. One of his uh, last, no, excuse me, if memory serves, one of his first, powers of, Power of Symbols Against the Symbols of Power, the Rise of Solidarity and the Fall of State Socialism in Poland. Well, I wish to thank all the gentlemen for joining us here today, and I will ask Professor Kubik to introduce or to give us a word of introduction concerning the um, history of World War II in the general European context. Thank you very much. It is an honor and pleasure to be here. I'm also terrified because the topic is very broad and I was told I have 12 minutes. I usually do not read my interventions, but since I wish to deliver a number of observations based on a study I have just embarked on, I will take the liberty to read a few things. Nevertheless, Felix Frankfurter uttered words which may be the most famous words concerning Jan Karski. He said, Mr. Karski, a person, a man like me talking to a man like you has to be totally frank. So I must say I am unable to believe you. Karski heard these words in Washington, and I do believe that they convey the atmosphere and the beginnings of the many stages of the process of constructing European memory, understood as a part of a common European cultural space. Often as not, governments and other actors 
behaved as if they were telling others, we cannot believe you. We cannot believe you, we cannot acknowledge that we can actually remember the past, specifically the crimes of both totalitarian systems, as you suggest. Hence the discrepancy of interpretations very often conflicting, and that conflict cannot really be told in its entirety or interpreted here. I wish to outline the interpretation positions and the differences between them. Interestingly, these positions were undergoing change, emphasizing that remembering and forgetting the past are an issue of interpretation conflict which occur in different realities. Over 70 years in the wake of uh, the end of World War II, each and every country had several stages of creating national memory. At each and every stage there were different relations between historical collective memory, responsibility, investigation, or the process of democratization or Europeanization. Discussions vary and they take place in different, at different levels, in, even in sermons, not meant to mention art and literature. Seventy years is a long time. We can try to tell the story of totalitarian systems in different ways. We can try a review of responding to three questions. Who is responsible? Secondly, for what? And thirdly, to whom? The question for what introduces us to an entanglement of collective responsibility matters. There are three fundamental objects of memory and responsibility. Firstly, fascist crimes, mainly the Holocaust. Secondly, communist crimes. And thirdly, the participation of local communities in crime. And the third, most probably, is discussed least frequently, or most frequently in the media and least fre frequently in official contact. Usually what people believe it is them or you who did stuff we didn't. Each and every one of these objects has been formed and shaped in terms of history and culture, and over the last 70 years, their recognition had obviously been undergoing constant change. The process of European integration begun begins with the coal and steel community in 1952, seven years after World War II. In other words, seven years had already gone past in terms of trying to reconcile with wartime crimes. So seven years of brooding went by, and I wish to remind you that it was not an economic project, but a political one. Politics is close to culture because communities are very important to culture, whereas identities of communities are built on the basis of common understanding of the past and common remembrance. The developing of European commonwealths does not start uh, with brooding on war. It begins with the creating of blocks of countries sharing a specific, specific policy of forgetting. Authorities in this, these countries decided to disremember for a time. I believe that the, such a postulant was very fragile. Germans began referring to that period as collective as Beschweigen. What happens next? Everything begins changing. There are a number of concepts of the change, and one is, I believe, excellent. It was suggested by Aleida Asman. She is going to be accompanying me here. She developed a something that Avishai Margalit suggested in Ethics of Memory. Asman distinguishes four stages. Firstly, dialogue-based forgetting. Right after the war, I was talking about it already. We agree to disremember in order to achieve different objectives. Interestingly enough, it was not new. The peace treaty after the 30-year war in 1648 contained a formula of perpetua oblivio et amnestia, perpetual oblivion and forgetting. If we forget, if we do decide to remember um, anything, we remember two things, the Germans and the Nazis, the Nazis were responsible and we remember our heroism and our resistance movement. Germany, Austria and France are typical countries. This begins to totter um, in the wake of 1950s and Eichmann's trial, the sentence was passed in 16. 
1962. Then we have the next stage. Remember to never allow forgetting. That has also been present in Asman's uh, writings, but also relates to the role of student revolutions, 1968 and generation changes. In France, that also is associated in the end with the end of the, Arge of the Algerian war and also ties in with the consideration of what we should do with the monstrous memory of colonialism which begins emerging. This is why people began working on the memory of colonies and also to reinvent or rethink the history of the Holocaust. After a while, we had a third form or phase, which ties in very closely with proposals of democracy offered in 1974 with the downfall of the authoritarian regime in Portugal, something that Huntington referred to as the third stage of democratization. It comes from the sidelines, and the fundamental slogan is to remember in order to forget. Forget long term, let us brought over it, now, let us scratch the scabs until they bleed, and then we can forget, and possibly we can move forward. Asman believes that today we have entered a mix of stage three with selected elements of model four, that is, dialogue-based remembrance. First stage was about dialogue-based based forgetting or oblivion. Stage four is about dialogue-based remembrance. Now, what kind of processes are we talking about here? There are at least four important matters to mention. Firstly, the processes of making Holocaust as a central element of European memory comes to the forefront. Documents are being produced by European Parliament and other authorities. Also, the EU expansion in 2004 introduces uh, countries with a totally different memory path to the community. Mildly put, that was a confusion, a spanner in the works of European expansion. And also, not few authors write about globalization in the context of increased migration, which involves long-term nationalism, which is obviously very important to a number of diasporas, when nationalism is much deeper than in original states. That evidently impacts memory. Fourthly, that stage involves everybody taking a very close look at everybody else. Roles playable under former models are not sufficient, are no longer sufficient. Let me remind you that we had different stages and different developments, and we had three models. The victor, who managed the evil, then we had the resistance hero, and thirdly, the victim. Now we have a fourth role which emerges, which needs reconciliation and brooding. That is, the witness or participant, co-participant who is partly to blame. That, ladies and gentlemen, is uh, beginning to change slowly but surely, and it involves another stage of European integration, whereby growing numbers of people are beginning to declare that in the wake of political and economic integration, should we continue the process, we should also begin integrating culture. We should try to consider the topic of cultural commonality, and definitely the Holocaust can become a cornerstone for such remembrance. Nevertheless, that involves remembrance and memory and brooding made more important in the wake of 2004, and that is the stage we have hit now. The final thing I wanted to say is, uh, is the following. I began wondering whether there is at all a possibility of introducing some law and order into the um, matter. I am a politologist, such as my main hat, which is why I always try to seek out generalizations and an option of grouping seemingly fragmented phenomena. Possibly we have a hypothesis of four groups of countries. It may seem controversial, but let us imagine a table. We have three columns, the remembrance of 
Nazis meant Holocaust, secondly, communism, communism, and thirdly, the collective memory of countries. In the first columns, the remembrance of the Nazi and Holocaust moves to the uh, realm of contempt. The memory of communism, mildly put, involves ambivalence or ambiguity, but the slowly growing acceptance of contempt, whereas the memory of uh, collectivity or co-participants have been already brought over. Post-communist countries, first group. Russia would be a good model. The memory of Nazi and uh, Holocaust, strong contempt. With regard to the um, memory of communism, ambiguity or ambivalence, would be possible, but rejection is uh, definitely stronger than contempt. Whereas with regard to the memory of co-participation, ambivalence is what it comes to the surface. It is actually the civic society who organize attempts to resolve the matter. The second group of post-communist countries would have a Latvia as a good representative. Nazi and Holocaust, ambivalent memory. Officially, they did condemn the uh, Nazi and Holocaust with appropriate documents uh, published, and the president also commented, but uh, that does not permeate the public sphere. With regard to the memory of communism, definite condemnation, whereas co-participation memory, no reconciliation or resolution whatsoever. The third group of post-communist countries, well, Poland, I believe, is a good representative of that group, and I believe that those processes are most advanced. Nazi and Holocaust, yes, condemnation. Condemnation also for the memory of communism, whereas co-participation, I believe that resolution and reconciliation is well advanced compared to other countries. To a great extent, thanks to what Jan Gross did and the debates surrounding what he did. Were we to compare Poland with other countries, wherever we go, the process is much slower and is much weaker. Now, what stems from all that? Um, I don't think I have uh, any more time to discuss it fully. So let me comment as follows. There are no absolutes. If we were to take a closer look at these 70 years, the first thing that becomes apparent is the tremendous changeability and evol evolution and an increasing, an increasingly growing dialogue base. We are taking a very close look at one another and I believe that this is the historical moment we have found ourselves in. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now over to Professor Andrzej Novak. Uh, he will give us a Polish perspective of the changes to memory. Thank you very much. I am going to start with a personal level, then I'm going to uh, um, comment on what is political and uh, historical move to um, uh, the evolution. Uh, the first message that I have to convey is that I have to leave at 5.45 to make a train to Krakow. My apologies. And seriously, I have a proposal in reference to the to empathy, something we talked about during first session was hugely important, also in the context of how Jan Karski approached others. I would like to suggest that you approach my own case uh, as ichthyologists approach a talking fish. This is uh, what I'm going to be speaking about for the first minute before I move on. I believe that uh, changes to the memory of Polish-Jewish rela relations and the Holocaust uh, do not really relate to 1989. Things happened before. Znak was published and uh, it was a Znak issue which was uh, cut short by the uh, censorship. The same thing goes for Jan Boński's article and surrounding polemics. But I believe that uh, um, Landsman 
Shoah in 1986 was something that really made a huge impression on me. The, my first impression was tremendous but also very positive. I all of a sudden found that I discovered a part of human nature which is horrible but which is part of all of us here, me included. I believe that all of us carry such a potential within us and I do believe that what we need is culture and education in order for that to be to never come to the surface then I found that Landsman sees it differently he wants to see see it as a national accusation he wants to tell us that you Poles are responsible for the Holocaust it is a national accusation and I believe that the film film's very structure proves it but also it has been proven when in open declarations that it is not a generally human picture, that it is not about other forms of Holocaust or other crime or other people who are to blame. It is about people who actually were bystanders and witnesses to and co-participants to that particular crime, Poles. I was obviously shocked. I wanted to reject it, but when looking at it ex post, I believe that we should distinguish something that was introduced by Ruth Benedict. He, um, she distinguished between the culture of shame and culture of blame. And I do believe that you could definitely go through a conversion and understand, yes, I am responsible for... The very fact that something like this was possible in my own country, nevertheless, in the social dimension, we can also only develop the culture of shame, not the culture of blame. In the social dimension, we can, over a very short period of time, um, do precisely that, and realistically speaking, it was possible since 1989, because... Something that Professor Kubik was talking about was not taking place in Poland. We had different ways of reaching truth about World War II and the Shoah. In Poland, uh, history was twisted differently than in the West. And uh, if we wish to pick up the tempo of reconciliation with the Holocaust similarly to what happened in, and what was happening in Europe over the past 40 years, then what happens is that we end up with a mutual feeling of discomfort. Some people believe or believe or react as I do. No, that is impossible. It's too fast. I have to find out more details and we need time, my fellow Poles and me, in order for shame to be converted to blame. And that ultimately means that we, ha we have to introduce certain levels of conformism or conformity. Uh, we cannot not feel shame for Polish co-participation in the Holocaust. Nevertheless, a long process separates us from reaching a culture of blame. We need to work on our communities in order for that process to be complete or completed relatively swiftly. A few words about the historical context. In Eastern Europe, something that Professor Kubik also said, um, had gone through a variety of crimes and different traumas affecting different communities, and which ultimately means that uh, we could introduce a distinction between culprits and victims. Indeed, in, yes, the Nazis were to blame for the Holocaust, but for example, if someone uh, survived the uh, Vowing genocide, uh, nearly 100,000 Poles were murdered by Ukrainian nationals, they are going to remember that particular Vowing massacre, and they will demand that the collective uh, community memory built after 1989 in a free way 
uh, to reconstruct that particular monument, monument of that memory. All you talk about now is the Holocaust, but that is not the only dimension of conflict. Interestingly enough, conflict also remains within what we refer to as nationalistic memory, the Poles, Polish national memory. Now we have a very interesting conflict between the memory of Katyn and the memory of Bowen. Uh, people say, no, we're not going to remember Katyn anymore, that has been uh, memorized and President Kaczynski kept talking about Katyn and he should have been talking more about Bowen. In other words, we have uh, different traumas and different crimes competing with one another. Now, uh, we had the... Um, I would like to refer to what the ladies talked about uh, before lunch in their introductory comments with regard to the collective imagination. We have become used to 1989. Upon 1989, we have had, or before 1989, we had centralized memory free of trauma. Now, each and every group would like their memory to be placed in such central position should be taught in schools sh and dozens of films should be made about the vowing crime or cutting or whatever else people might come up with for example the um, crimes of the red army of red army troops raping polish women but there are different re realities uh, we have to face. The younger generations don't want to hear anything about the Holocaust or other crimes. Hence, memory is now beginning to compete against an ever more narrow ledge of social interest, which ultimately generates tensions between different forms of remembrance. That tension may be found pathetic, that tension may be found uh, unfortunate, but all of that could also be seen as the removal of Holocaust remembrance. Nevertheless, appealing to your empathy, I would like to show the difficulties experienced by someone who, for whom the Holocaust was not the most important point of memory in his or her family. My family, family was not mm, heroic. My mother was kept by, in a Nazi concentration camp. My father was imprisoned. Such experiences were quite typical. Nevertheless, uh, the memory of Nazi crimes uh, had been accentuated under communist times, whereas communist crimes were not accentuated. A number of uh, traumas associated with the reign of the Russian Empire in Poland had not been sufficiently accentuated before 1989. This is why um, in the wake of 1989, small minorities um, wanted to accentuate their memories and wanted their memories to be found on a broader stage. And it turned out that this broader stage is already occupied by dozens of films about the Holocaust. It is not true that the Holocaust is absent from the collective memory of um, the mass media and culture. It is present there. The question remains whether it is there and whether it is repeated and recited and revived. Nevertheless, uh, on the side or with when it comes to so-called lesser crimes, what we feel is that our memory is absent from the central memory. It is absent from central memory because we have no such thing as a central memory any longer. The Institute for National Remembrance does fulfill the role, but fortunately enough, it does not resemble anything that we had under communist times. We also have certain traumas and certain crimes which have not been memorized or accentuated at all. And obviously when watching Shoah I was trying to take my own personal viewpoint, possibly Polish, possibly chauvinistic. Nevertheless, when trying to take a closer look at different 20th century crimes, I wish to recall what I read in a Journal of Modern History where where Gabriel Rosen wrote a very interesting thing about the industry of remembrance. He wrote that everything has already been remembered. 
All memories and all remembrances have been reconciled with the Aborigines, the Indians, the Hutu and Tutsi tribes. Uh, he claimed that this is so, but that is not so. There are groups out there who do not believe that their remembrance Remem is present. For example, Poles murdered in the Soviet Union in 1937. Huge crime. Uh, many historians, also those of Jewish origin in um, America, compare that to the Holocaust, something between the Armenian Holocaust and the World War II Holocaust. Every other adult Pole alive in the Soviet Union were murdered, and no one said anything because the rest were sent to a uh, to Kazakh camps and died there. No distinguished literary authors described it, and memory died. I do believe that the duty of a human being, not necessarily a Pole, is to speak of those no one speaks about. Fortunately, the Holocaust has been referred to and is being referred to by many people. Fortunately enough also for me, because I am learning and learning. I am learning about a very sad historical truth, which also affects my own cultural and historical community. But we should also remember those others who have not been remembered, who have been forgotten, who have fallen into oblivion. And we should ask the question, what um, we should do next? Uh, since my time is growing, drawing to a close, I have a suggestion to um, for all of those of you who speak Polish, uh, read a wonderful poem uh, by Bolesław Leśmian. It is called Confession. That poem uh, was published for the first time in his collected works in the year 2010. And the poem was written in 1915. This poem is a terrible harbinger of the Holocaust and also a collected vision of remembrance, of collective memory. I cannot think of a more beautiful poem in 20th century Polish literature that wants to describe something that we have been talking about uh, all day today. And that is all from me. Let's Leśmian speak. Thank you very much, Professor. Myślę, że Polska, polskie rywalizacje I do believe that Polish remembrance rivalries tend to be difficult uh, for us and painful, but they are also absolutely nothing in comparison with what is going on in the Ukraine, in our neighbor's yard. This is why Professor Hryzak has joined us. And I would like to ask about the memory of Holocaust, because on the one hand we do have the communist memories and we also have the memory of the Ukrainian nationals and nationalistic followers. What does your memory look like? Well, thank you very much for the honor of uh, inviting me to this conference. I must say that uh, I feel not entirely comfortable because I have to speak with um, or in a language which is not my own and also I am speaking of a topic that I don't like to talk about. I met very few professional historians who like speaking about memory. Because, well, politologists, theologists, economists, yes, but not historians. But actually, today, we have to speak of memory, because what is going on in our country now, and that is the war, is very closely related to memory and remembrance. Whenever speaking of Ukraine over the last years, I took a certain tactic which I changed now. Right until 2013, I was always referring to examples of other countries that we ought to be following as the country. I don't do that anymore. I do believe that in the wake of Euromaidan, Ukraine became a country who could be a role model for others. I do not know whether whether you know, but um, European intellectuals appealed to their authorities in Western Europe in early January, and they referred to Ukraine as Europe at its best. And there is something to it. Today the country is beautiful. Probably you do know that uh, following our latest Europe, our latest parliamentary elections, neither the communists nor the nationalists made it to the parliament, which is a unique thing for this part of Europe. 
So I do have the tactic, but I have the exception, I remember the exception, that is the Holocaust. The way of talking or speaking about the Holocaust is uh, absolutely sh absolutely shameful. Uh, Tony Judd, in his uh, post-war, wrote that uh, taking on full blame for the Holocaust is the first step to towards full European integration. So Euro Ukraine keeps talking about its European ambitions, but don't, doesn't want to buy the ticket. In other words, doesn't want to assume responsibility. A few words about reasons. Obviously, uh, those reasons are different. That is the communist um, heritage, different developments. Obviously, by saying Soviet, I do not mean what was going on in Poland. It was different. Now, in terms of uh, the Holocaust, the Soviet tactic was very simple. We didn't talk about it. Uh, we uh, always said that Jews died because they were Soviet citizens, not that they because they were Jews, and that was the general line. Interestingly enough, we also have uh, a very interesting and important study by our friend Sigitman, who emphasized that there were huge differences in terms of how the lack of remembrance was implemented. It turned out that Estonia, in Estonia, you could find some mentions of the Holocaust in uh, history books for children, whereas uh, in uh, Estonia, mm, that was very rare. Whereas uh, Soviet Ukraine, he described as an extreme because uh, uh, Jews are meant to be non-existent. I have an older colleague uh, who uh, co-wrote uh, 10 volumes of the his Ukrainian history. It is a very weak and stupid book. It was re written as a response to what was written in the diaspora. So they met in Ukraine and all they said was say nothing about Jews. And it turned out that we have 10 volumes of historian of, excuse me, Ukrainian and Soviet history, which says not one word about Jews. And no one can really tell us or, and, or explain why Ukraine was so extreme in this case. I simply want to emphasize that Ukraine is struggling with a very special heritage, not really post-Soviet, but the Ukrainian brand of uh, post-Soviet heritage. And this heritage is unfortunately still our fill. Well, the other narration is very obvious, nationalistic narration. I am not going to go into detail here. It is correct what, what Professor Andrei Novak said, but one correction, please. We are skipping the um, Ukrainian uh, nationalistic na narration. We seem to be resembling what was going on in Poland between the wars. Nationalists believe that we are under constant threat, obviously from Russian, uh, but uh, we also have the Russian-speaking part of Ukraine, and uh, people are afraid, or nationalists are afraid, that we are going to become diluted in terms of our language and culture. And uh, some people believe that uh, since we are not building our national traditions, our country will uh, disappear. All our presidents, Yanukovych included, included, tried to do something to build our national culture. Indeed, Yushchenko was the most intense in his campaigns. And I must say that uh, Yushchenko spoke most about the Holocaust, but in a very instrumental way. He believed uh, that uh, he, we should be building our national remembrance basing on hunger, on our memories of hunger. But in order to emphasize it, in order to introduce an international dimension, he compared to that hunger to the Ukrainian version of the Holocaust. Uh, even um, the Ukrainian um, word for hunger was, tri was changed to Holodomor in order to resemble Holocaust. Obviously, Yushchenko's policy was terrible in every possible sense of the word, but interestingly enough, that was the only thing that he managed, that he was successful in promoting hunger, proved that over the last couple of years, 
uh, well, after Yushchenko resigned from office, after he ended his term of office, we did reach a consensus that yes, uh, we do have a common remembrance of genocidal hunger. And that is something that no one really noticed. Um, even Putin and the Kremlin didn't notice that. It turned out that um, Ukrainian statehood is moving beyond uh, Ukrainian-speaking areas and has been reaching Odessa and others. Now, what is the weakness? Hypocrisy is the weakness. We are introducing a relativistic approach to Holocaust. Comparisons are being made. People are saying, okay, that the number of dead Ukrainians is equal to the number of dead Jews, so the scales and nature are being compared. And secondly, nothing is done in order to accept the blame for the Holocaust, because it is obvious that we are victims and that's it. And the same thing um, applies to us what was described by Professor Andrzej Novak. And this is something I wanted to um, emphasize without going into detail. But yes, we do have the two post-Soviet uh, narrations or narratives, one of which is nationalistic. Yes, indeed. Uh, we were quite dramatic history and we were very lucky that we didn't end up with a Serbo-Croat solution. It turned out that uh, part of our Ukrainian society accepts uh, elements of both narratives and they don't see a problem with that. This is something I would like to leave you with. This is important because it is the it is what we are in central Ukraine. Uh, Donbass is different and I must say that everybody has different solutions or different approaches to the task of building a relatively stable community. Now, what is important in this case as well? Uh, truthfully, in the wake of World War II, we did have an attempt of putting together a third narrative, the so-called liberal narrative, and it was represented by the um, small group of intellectuals, of historians who traveled to the United States. Uh, they were neither communists and nor um, nationalists, uh, they had a problem with Stalin and the Bandera, which was hugely important. Uh, so uh, uh, they actually leaned uh, towards uh, Western universities and hence the attempt of building a third narrative. And actually they created a new identity, uh, not ethnically as Yushchenko did, but they decided to create national identity in the civic sense of the word. And I would like to refer to Lipinski, a very well-known publicist and activist. He was um, a Pole, but he became Ukrainian by, cho by choice, and he created a concept that he wanted to all Ukrainians to join. He suggested the so-called American or civic option, open to all groups, and this is how our ideology started. And I must say that this is uh, this was when when uh, um, the truly the Polish-Ukrainian dialogue began, and we all a lot to such people as Rodnitsky, for example. With regard to Ukrainian-Jewish relations, this dialogue uh, fell apart because we could not reach a, any consensus about the Holocaust. Uh, in Toronto, we were talking about anything and everything, with the exception of the uh, Holocaust, because then um, part of the Jewish delegation left the room in protest. But what happened? Well, yes, indeed, we are... We have begun speaking of responsibility. Nevertheless, they are seeking the third way out. They have excellent intentions, but uh, we do not have Jan Gross in the Ukraine. Nobody wants to move that far for a variety of reasons. Very briefly, what happened most recently? This is important, as I see it. What happened in the wake of um, 1914? Um, well, it is... Um, I do not know what is going to uh, happen 
later on, but also as in 1914, today also things have changed radically. The Soviet discourse uh, have, uh, has actually collapsed. And I do believe that best proof can be offered by the uh, mass destruction of uh, uh, Stalin's monuments in Ukraine. And I do believe that this proves what is going on. I believe that the area of Soviet influence have narrowed down to Donbass and the Crimean Peninsula. And I do believe that once we deal with that, we can also deal with our anti-Semitism, because anti-Semitism may bind us to a certain extent to what the West believe in terms of that, that once we lean towards the West, we can also reconcile with our anti-Semitism. So we did have the communist narrative and the orange revolutionary narrative, and now we have a narrative whereby for the first time we do have a group of Jews who identify themselves with Ukraine, Ukrainian Jews, which is very important and I find truly wonderful. Today, we have a specific symbol of the Ukrainian, um, je, of the Ukrainian Jew, the uh, Kołomoyski, the current uh, governor of Dniepropietrovsk. Uh, he is proud of his Jewish identity and he is also a Ukrainian and I believe that he is now the main rival of the Donetsk Republic. Because I do believe that uh, you have to understand that uh, uh, the main line of demarcation is between Dniepropetrovsk and Donetsk. Uh, this is something that has to be understood. So the seed is there, the root is there, and we do have our opportunity to succeed. Thank you very much. We are still remaining with the east of uh, Europe, but definitely to the north, Estonia. Dr. Pablo. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And uh, I'm very glad that I was invited to share also experiences of Estonia here. I'm sorry, I don't speak Polish, so therefore you have to uh, listen to the translation. Um, <laughs> Estonian Holocaust is definitely not uh, the center of uh, Estonian Second World War memories. Uh, there are, of course, different reasons for, for that, and I tried to uh, elaborate them and, and also the dynamics uh, after the collapse of the Soviet, uh, Soviet period. Um, first, uh, Estonian Holocaust is called as uh, Holocaust without antisemitism or, or hatred uh, towards Jews. Uh, and, um, this is very strongly integrated in Estonian uh, uh, narrative that Estonia was a very Jew-friendly country until the war. Uh, Jews had a cultural autonomy. Uh, the community, Jewish community, was relatively small, uh, four, four and a half uh, thousand people, uh, which uh, was also relatively well integrated into Estonian society. Uh, so therefore, there wasn't uh, in the society this kind of very strong uh, anti-Semitic um, uh, attitude. Uh, when um, the war started uh, and uh, when uh, Nazis uh, reached to Estonia, then uh, out of these uh, four, four and a half thousand Jews, probably historians assume one thousand uh, had left in Estonia. Uh, the rest uh, escaped to Soviet Union and uh, thereby managed to escape uh, the, the Holocaust. Uh, out of this 1,000, uh, uh, almost all uh, were uh, executed. Very, very few uh, managed to survive. Uh, there is not very well documented history of, of the survivors uh, in Estonia and uh, uh, the Estonian Jewish community this, uh, uh, who, who stayed in <coughs> Estonia, basically the liquidation or uh, extermination of, of this community, 
ended uh, by the for year 41, so that uh, in 42 Estonia was uh, called uh, Judenfrei. Uh, why it was so quickly, why it was so easy to do, it was also due to this cultural autonomy, uh, because cultural autonomy included the list of people, and then therefore it was very easy for uh, uh, authorities to uh, reach to these uh, these these people. Uh, when we talk about uh, Estonians' involvement in uh, in uh, these events, then um, uh, it's not denied. Uh, it's admitted. Uh, Though particularly related to, to the Estonian own Jewish uh, population, it's not very clear, uh, or not very often, and not very clearly spoken uh, how uh, they disappeared. Uh, the bigger amount of, of Jews executed in Estonia, uh, they were brought from other European countries. So that around 10,000 uh, Jews were brought to Estonian uh, concentration camps, which were not extermination camps, uh, but labor camps. But uh, in the end, when uh, Nazis uh, withdraw, uh, then uh, uh, these camps became also extermination camps. Uh, and uh, Estonian uh, historiography uh, makes the uh, difference between those two, uh, two groups of, of victims. Uh, so this is very, very briefly uh, about the Holocaust in, in Estonia. Um, but um, I, I want to speak more about uh, how this, uh, this is remembered and how the remembering of, of these <coughs> events has, has changed. Uh, Estonia definitely is not the exception uh, from Poland or, or Ukraine. Uh, Soviet regime uh, also in Estonia uh, made people to, uh, to forget uh, these events or as much it happened so quickly, uh, uh, it uh, didn't uh, penetrate an entire society then uh, also social memory of, uh, of Holocaust in Estonia is very, very fragmented. Uh, in Estonia, there is a very uh, good, big database of uh, oral history. Uh, and uh, there is also um, uh, analyzed the, the, the memories about the uh, Nazi occupation, uh, but um, the, the Holocaust comes in uh, into these uh, uh, life stories uh, very, very briefly, only as the stories told through the third, fourth, or, or fifth person. Uh, so therefore, it uh, does not exist in, uh, in uh, social memory in, uh, in Estonia. Uh, and uh, of course, when the uh, Soviet Union uh, uh, collapsed, uh, then um, Estonian historiography also started to uh, be rewritten. Uh, when the Soviet uh, historiography was talking about uh, two groups of uh, Nazi victims, uh, war prisoners and civilians, uh, then of course uh, Estonian, uh, independent Estonian uh, historiography uh, already immediately included Jews, but not only Jews, but also Roma, because also Estonian Roma community was uh, exterminated uh, uh, during uh, <coughs> uh, Nazi occupation. Uh, and as I said, uh, Estonian involvement uh, was not denied. Uh, partly it's also related uh, to, to the Soviet times where um, those people uh, who uh, were involved in, uh, in Nazi regime, uh, they were uh, punished, uh, they were defined as a traitor of the nation and, and uh, so on. Uh, called Nazist, uh, fascist, uh, and actually this label was given to everybody who were against Soviet regime. And this is also not a very specific Estonian case. It uh, happened all over the uh, uh, territories what Soviet Union took over, so that uh, this label was used to get rid of all kind of opponents of uh, Soviet regime. Um, and then this probably, on one hand, uh, 
did not make uh, Estonians to, to deny uh, their own involvement, uh, but uh, it's not defined as uh, nationwide uh, involvement, but uh, it is uh, defined as representative of Estonian nation uh, involved in uh, Holocaust uh, atrocities. And not only in Estonia, but um, also uh, other territories, uh, Belarus uh, also you know, on, on Polish territories. Um, one um, big step was uh, made when uh, our first president, uh, uh, Leonard Meri, uh, he called uh, the investigation uh, committee to investigate the, the Soviet crimes and also Nazi crimes in, in Estonia. And this was uh, very important because uh, the, the Soviet historiography was clearly creating uh, stories which uh, were not uh, uh, even uh, uh, close to the reality. Uh, for example, uh, one, uh, just one example, that the number of victims of uh, overall uh, Nazi crimes in Estonia uh, decreased uh, three to five times. Uh, that's just for illustration uh, what kind of stories uh, the, the Soviet historiography uh, created. Uh, and then the, this uh, committee also, without emotions, very uh, briefly listed uh, uh, the, the results. Uh, it has not caused uh, this kind of uh, mm, uh, nationwide discussion uh, about uh, the, the national involvement. Uh, more that uh, brought this uh, discussion and, and where I can see where this kind of um, competition dimension uh, uh, was, uh, was involved uh, was related to the early 2000s. Um, <laughs> Uh, it was the period when Estonia was preparing uh, for NATO membership. Uh, 2002, Estonia was invited to, to the talks with, uh, with NATO. Uh, and, uh, and this uh, also uh, then uh, uh, gave for, uh, or made Estonia maybe more vulnerable for, for external uh, pressure. And at least that's how it was uh, felt uh, domestically in, in Estonia. And then it was uh, at the same time, on one hand, the United States uh, called Estonia to, uh, to deal more actively with the Holocaust. Uh, Holocaust uh, Commemoration Day was established in Estonia. Uh, and also, a Wiesenthal Center uh, made this kind of uh, call, uh, basically calling uh, Estonia to admit national guilt in, in Holocaust. But this, instead of helping to deal with this issue uh, caused this kind of uh, opposite reaction. Uh, it basically uh, made Estonians to feel that uh, their sufferings during the Soviet uh, regime, they are not important. Uh, and this Holocaust narrative is uh, uh, pushed outside on, uh, on es Estonians. Uh, and um, uh, this, this created this kind of conflictual moment. Uh, however, I would say that for, for now, this uh, situation uh, has changed. Uh, there is the try not to uh, present the stories uh, <laughs> as a competitive stories, but rather to present stories of totalitarian atrocities, uh, the Nazi crimes, including Holocaust, or mentioning separately Holocaust uh, within there and uh, the Soviet crimes. Uh, and uh, this is my just kind of prediction that this is probably the direction where Estonia is, is trying to move, that uh, uh, not to present these this, uh, narratives or memories that one is more important than the other, because uh, that definitely wouldn't uh, help to, to incorporate the Holocaust narrative in Estonian uh, historiography. Uh, but uh, rather to present them parallel to make them mutually understandable. 
Bardzo dziękuję. Panie Thank profesorze, you very much. Professor, się do profesora I am Lagru. now speaking to Zachęcam Professor Lagru. In our part of Europe, the West is very often perceived as a role model in a variety of circumstances. Is the West also a role model in terms of reconciliation with the past and broadening on and discussing uh, Holocaust-related matters. I'm uh, in the enviable position to be the last speaker. I think I lost the count, like most of you. We are at 20 plus speakers, so I'll try to be short. Um, <clears throat> until this panel started, I was a little bit worried um, whether I had really my place um, in, in, in this meeting, because after all, the story of Karski is very much a Polish-American story. And, um, well, the European dimension uh, was not very present, but after having listened to my four colleagues, I, uh, I feel fully at ease about this European dimension. First of all, I absolutely agree uh, with Andrei Novak that um, there is no absolute memory of the Holocaust. There's only relative memories. Um, the question is not, should we remember the Holocaust, but how much place do we award to the Holocaust relative to other historical events? Um, we cannot write history with scissors, that is, cut out one event and then uh, discuss it in splendid isolation. This event is very much embedded in other events. Um, we mentioned the Armenian genocide earlier this morning. If we want a European debate on historical responsibilities of Turkey, um, I think we cannot cut out the Armenian genocide with scissors and then impose an exclusive dialogue with Turkey on the Armenian genocide without implying the expulsion of Muslims from Europe since 1850, without implying the Greek aggression of uh, 1919, without implying Sykes-Picot agreement, without implying the Sever agreements, um, um, etc. And I think that this might be an angle to tackle um, the asymmetry of memory that is at um, the heart of our discussion today. And um, of course, if you're talking about East-West, um, there is an asymmetry of events before there is an asymmetry um, of memories um, that has to do with the size of the Jewish community. Um, we are talking about a Jewish community that is 10 times as large um, in Poland as in almost all the other, <coughs> all the West European countries um, combined. There is the issue of the extermination rate, but then maybe the divide is not as clearly East-West. Um, the Netherlands would be much closer to Poland, while France, Belgium, and especially Denmark would be far removed. Um, there is, of course, also in the asymmetry of event, the um, recent nature of the Polish state and the fact that contentious questions of citizenship and nationality have, in a way, been settled in these West European countries more than a century earlier and were much more open um, and thus conflictual in Poland. There's an asymmetry of place. Um, we could say it's a logistical accident that the Jews from Western Europe ended up being killed in Poland. But that, of course, has far-going implications in memory debates where somehow, um, indeed, the Holocaust becomes associated with Poland. Do we um, then forcibly have a symmetry of memories? Um, and I'm not so sure, and I can easily subscribe to this fourfold typology um, of Jan Kubik. I think comparing um, Poland with France, the Netherlands, Belgium, um, we can say that the memory of the Holocaust is both very central and in a way contested by other groups who feel marginalized by the attention given to Holocaust memory. I think in all these cases, the focus is very much on national responsibilities far more than on German authorship. These are memories about what did we do in the genocide in killing Jews, much more than pointing the finger um, to Germany. Um, and, and that has been so for several decades in all of these countries. Um, is there then a particularity in Poland because of um, the strength of Polish anti-Semitism, which indeed has been the message of Claude Lanzmann's Shoah? Um, I guess certainly much less so in 1946, for instance, than in 1968 or in 1992. And um, in that regard, indeed, if there is an asymmetry of memory, it has very much to do with the Cold War and with the way memories developed since 1945. 
Now, um, if the Holocaust, as it's genuinely a European uh, event, uh, a shared history, and if the ways of dealing with its memory are also increasingly European, um, why is it that there is still so much incomprehension and, in a way, a lack of trust between European countries? Stereotypes of ignorant Westerners, um, insensible to Polish suffering, and uh, other stereotypes of dangerous Polish anti-Semites and, and nationalists. Um, how can we go beyond these stereotypes? What would be the conditions for a constructive dialogue? And I guess that that implies to move away from the Holocaust as an exclusive object um, to, a, to larger narratives on the 20th century and the relative place of the Holocaust in this. Well, I tend to get quite upset often with many of my colleagues, students, politicians, and neighbors in, in, in Western Europe who still seem not to have noticed that the Iron Curtain came down, not just because they still tend to believe that um, whatever lies between the Oder and Phnom Penh are part of the perpetual killing fields of human history, um, not just because they still secretly and I think quite too often publicly um, regret the 2004 enlargement to people genetically unsuited for democracy, but I guess much more importantly because they fail to notice that whatever it is that happened in 1989 is relevant to them no less than those on the former other side. That 1989 um, is what makes our presence and our future. So I have set myself the challenge to put um, Poland on the mental map, at least of my students who are a captive audience. Um, now, of course, unfortunately, I also sometimes get upset by the perfectly counterproductive ways in which some ex-communist countries cater their histories for foreign West European audiences. The least one can say after visiting the Occupation Museum in Riga or the Genocide Museum in Vilnius is that these are not very helpful narrative. Um, you just, you just um, should read a user's manual of West European visitors if you want to be understood. Um, so you just should stop weaning about being misunderstood. Try to learn to speak a language that can be understand that Westerners are ready to listen to. You're joining a new club, and um, if you want other members of the club to be sensitive to your story, you must probably also try to find ways that are acceptable um, for them. And um, <clears throat> the least one can say then is that among these formerly communist countries, Poland certainly has given itself the means of its ambitions. Um, last month I took 45 of my students to a study tour of Warsaw um, and Gdansk, and I told my students um, there is probably no other place on earth that has invested so much in the representation of its recent history, that has so many ambitious, that is 50 to 100 million um, euro um, great history museums that are either just completed or being completed. Um, I also told the Polish Cultural Institute, who very generously helped us in realizing this, this exhibition, that, well, here I have a group of 45 future history professors, and um, I tend to understand that Polish authorities are not very happy that West European history teachers used to take their students exclusively to visits to Polish bed camps, and that you are not very happy with that. Well, now help us to make them discover another Poland, and this is what they very much did. And I think that my students came back with a very different idea of Poland, not just an immense graveyard, but a vibrant country, very much um, alive in, in, in contrasting ways to confront its past, um, a rich country too, that has these ambitious means, even if some of the money is European Union money, um, inventive, provocative ways um, of dealing with the past. And maybe, I think, probably most of my students thought that the designers of the Uprising Museum did not read the user's manual of the Western visitor very carefully either. But if we then um, went to um, the, history, the Museum of the History of Polish Jews, to the Solidarity Center in Warsaw and other places, um, I think they were very much impressed by the sheer dynamics of Polish dealing with the past um, which compare very favorably, I must say, with what one could find in most Western European um, countries. Um, I see that I'm um, 
exceeding my time, and I imagine that you all say, well, where is this user manual of Western visitors? Can we buy it? Um, of course, it, it doesn't exist, but one might um, produce it and, and, and just launch a few um, keywords, um, the words that create trouble. And um, one of them would be, well, the triad of occupation, collaboration, resistance, which are very valid and can um, be used in a comparative way, say for the years 39, 49, but no, not to cover the entire period stretching to 89, talking about collaboration, resistance, occupation um, for the full period um, of communism it does not make more sense than to talk about five centuries of Ottoman occupation um, in Greece. Others would be communism. Well, let's not forget that communism um, was uh, the opposition force in Western Europe for half a century. Um, um, that, well, communist parliamentarians were not asked to vote the budget of the Soviet Gulag, but they were asked to vote the budget of colonial wars, and they were, in the end, the only ones who consistently refused to do so. And since Poles have such a endearing relations with opposition, this is my, something that the Conon also understand. Another buzzword would be totalitarianism, but it's probably too complicated um, to do this now. And I'll rush to, to my conclusion. Um, I think if we see the the way um, European memories are converging, um, we see that our history might have followed asymmetrical paths in the past, but they are now joining in a shared present and in shared future challenges. Also, um, I think, in a shared recourse to the past that is not a set of inspiring examples, as Karski, but very much history as a cautionary tale, history as a scarecrow, um, shared in Eastern and Western Europe, and certainly also by the policies implemented by the European Commission. The message seems to be a very binary one, a choice between European cooperation, democracy, tolerance, and human rights, on the one hand, totalitarianism, totalitarianism mass crimes, genocides, on the other. But what do we understand by democracy in such a constellation? Is it universal free suffrage and majority rule? Or is it human rights, minority protection, and tolerance? I think that our common European history from the late 19th century to the early 21st century um, abounds with examples of how universal suffrage, majority rule, or the anticipation of them have sparked ethnic tension, violence, pogroms, ethnic cleansing, and genocide. We are not talking about binary choices between mutually exclusive political regimes, whereby one would hold the monopoly of violence and intolerance, the other the um, monopoly of peace and human rights. I think that in the figure of Jan Karski, um, we are talking about individual responsibility in its universal dimension. Karski's story, in a way, is less about Maidan Square or Tahir Square than it is about dissonance, about courage and abnegation. If we would have to give a Jan Karski medal um, today, who would be dignified candidates? Would these be contemporary whistleblowers? Would it be maybe individuals who took general personal risks and who were still not listened to? Um, should we dare to mention Snowden, Assange, um, Bradley Manning? Isn't it part of Karski's legacy that also that great democracies can be deaf when they receive an important message? And I guess that in that sense, Karski's legacy is far more universal than a mere political reading of 20th century history and a schematical clash between democracy and totalitarianism. Far beyond also his significance as a Christian, as a Polish patriot, and as a righteous Gentile. Thank you. Thank you very much for these excellent interventions. If I may, I would like to ask a question. 
a single question of all our panelists. And I do believe that to a greater or lesser extent it applies to all of Europe, possibly with the sole exception of Ukraine, where Holocaust-related matters have not really been resolved. I believe that they have to begin talking about the Holocaust and the potential blame of Ukrainians for the Holocaust. But I believe that a certain thing has transpired that came to my mind in the context of our discussion and what we were talking about before. I believe that we are moving from ex one extreme to another because on the one hand uh, the entire blame was assigned to the assigned to the Nazis and now we are leaning towards the other extreme, such as uh, that which Professor Novak mentioned, families who were imprisoned did not at all participate in the Holocaust, which is exactly why I should ask the question, why should I feel co-responsible for the Holocaust? Isn't it true that if we decide to erase or eradicate the connection between the direct blame, such as has been shouldered by Germans or German Nazis, and uh, softer responsibility of nations on the other hand, don't you think that given the circumstances, we are committing a mistake which relates to the identification of the sources of evil? Uh, we are extrapolating that blame to everybody, i.e. to nobody. As I see it, two attitudes or two approaches uh, are in contradiction here. The historian in me tries to resist the phenomenon you described. For example, if I am watching a movie by Marzyński, Sztetl, very well-known documentary, and the final scene takes place in a contemporary New York high school, and uh, students of that high school condemn Poles for not having provided assistance to Jews, and they say, we would have done it. That film does not tell us that um, helping Jews carried the death penalty, and the historian in me opposes, because we have to show the historical truth in its entirety. In Poland, harboring Jews carried the death penalty, and uh, only in such context can you say that I would have helped. So, as a historian, I am against a, an exercise of relativism. We should not be placed at a single level with the Nazis as a country. Whereas, from the mor moral vantage point, as a human being, I can share a perspective where I will have to accept my co-responsibility for crime, scale notwithstanding. In case of my own historical or cultural community, it is going to be much smaller by hundreds of an orders of magnitude than in terms of Germans, but still I have to recognize the potential of the beast awakening in me as shown in Shoah. Once we go back to the general human perspective, which is definitely about not letting the potential of the beast awaken, once we do that, we can also appreciate the efforts of reaching everybody with the lesson of the Holocaust. There are many countries which were totally free of the Holocaust, albeit the risk of hostility or hatred towards others is present throughout all countries, regardless of whether Jews live there or not. Professor Kubik. I believe that the problem relates to anybody who wants to participate in the project of developing national identities. We have to stop and think whether the problem is there and whether we can actually pick something to forget and pick something to remember. This is something we will have to focus on. And actually, Janek, you wrote that, you wrote about it when writing about Jedwabne. 
We should definitely stop and think whether we are responsible for the entire past, which is told according to our beliefs of the past. If we adopt this truth, then do we have the right of picking and choosing between what we are going to forget or remember? And the point is not to make Poles equal to Germans in terms of their blame. This is something that has been discussed today extensively. We have already been told that these were totally different institutional machines. Uh, we did not have uh, SS units built solely or developed solely with uh, Polish troops um, as opposed to Ukraine or Estonia, for example, but we did have people responsible for anti-Semitism. Today we also have individuals responsible for broadcasting anti-Semitism, quote-unquote, and I do believe that we are not saying enough about it. We know that the Catholic Church is a megaphone for anti-Semitism, and I am deeply shocked that Polish priests are not being told off for what they are saying off the pul pulpit. The Polish bishop occasionally does what he should, but more often he does not. Yes, indeed, Poland did carry a death penalty for harboring Jews, but some people helped and others didn't. All of them were facing the same threat of death penalty. Now, if we are to embark upon the joint project of developing a common vision of who we are as Poles, we have to understand that we have those who behaved like Karski did, although the, they were facing the death penalty threat, while others behaved differently. So, who gives us the right to pick and choose? It is an ethical question. Professor Lagru. Ever less people directly responsible for the killing of Jews. There are very uh, few people surviving. Uh, then, are there entire nations um, guilty of um, killing the Jews? Um, there have been um, controversies, both in France and in Belgium, that ended up, I think, being quite pathetic between highly critical Belgian or French historians who insisted on national responsibilities. We uh, have the lion's share of responsibility for Jew the persecution of the Jews, and then critical German historians who try to claim back some of the guilt, saying, no, no, you, you're, you're, you're forgetting about the Germans. We are the real um, evildoers in this story. This ends up being, I think, um, quite surreal. What is the issue of responsibility um, should not be translated into national terms, but very much into ideological terms. And I think it is then far too easy to say that, well, um, um, the Holocaust is, is linked to ideologies that have nothing in common with us. If we think about it, well, the recipes to build up Europe after 1918, universal suffrage and national self-determination, um, are the, at the very heart of the kind of processes that caused the Holocaust, but it caused also the killing of Poles in Volhynia. Um, and, and in very many other places that caused the massacres in, in, in Anatolia, uh, um, starting in, in, in 1915. That is probably much more difficult to admit, because after all, still today, um, including in, in places like Ukraine, we, are, we still believe that universal suffrage and national self-determination will do the trick, um, will solve the problems, um, admitting that, that they are part of the problem and that Holocaust is not something we can send back to the dark nights of the past and, and, and to, to Adolf Hitler and Nazism and totalitarianism and everything you want. No, it is at the heart of our modern political ideologies. This is how we are, I guess, all responsible um, for the genocide. And, and that is quite a difficult challenge, I think, for the European Union today. Um, if we are responsible, because we still share much of the ideology that was at the root of what happened, um, how do we go on from this? How can we challenge the idea that whatever it is we call democracy is um, the total solution for everything? It is not. And I think this is a more, much more productive way of thinking, yes, we are all responsible in terms of our ideologies that we still adhere to, not just in terms of the nationality we happen to have. I have just been told that we should be drawing to a close, but I suggest that we give a chance to our audience.
at least two or three comments. I will try to speak Polish. I am a Polish-American scientist, a researcher. I attended a conference by the Institute of National Remembrance. I delivered an intervention, a paper on the Cold War and on the process of Americanizing during World War II and of World War II. We have been talking about the West or Western Europe and of the United States. It is a very broad topic, but I must say that the influence of American historiographic researchers is definitely huge when it comes to what has been going on in Europe. I would like to respond to what has just been said. We have always been praising Professor Gross, also in this pan panel, but his work is controversial, has also been questioned by Polish researchers, Polish historians. Several years ago, we organized, we organized a conference in Lisbon, and there was a separate panel dedicated to his work, and it still remains controversial. In 1970, Professor Gross's book, Polish Society Under German Occupation, was published. It was also definitely translated into a number of languages. And in the introduction, Jan Gross says that there are two topics that he will not touch upon the developing and apparent communist system and the Jewish question in Poland, because that is a separate topic. Maybe Professor Gross is going to be speaking about it tomorrow. So what we were facing was segregation. Please ask your question or cut your uh, intervention short, please. Dr. Ewa Kurek wrote a book about uh, Jewish communes in uh, Poland and uh, the new version contains a response to Jedwabne, a reaction to Jedwabne and the so-called Polish anti-Semitism and she uh, polemizes with Professor Gross in her book. My apologies, we're going to be talking about it tomorrow. One of the gentlemen here mentioned the context. I have been watching the development of American historiography and uh, the Holocaust is discussed irrespective of World War II. With uh, my respect for Jan Karski, I wrote, I read his volumes in Polish and English languages. I understand. So we are not talking about World War II, we should be talking about the Holocaust. Well, the point is that um, Nazi occupation in Poland was totally different than elsewhere. Poland was witness to the um, death of 17% of her nation. There were different, and Poland was under Nazi occupation and under Soviet occupation. There were different changes to loyalty and cases of treason. So uh, we were being, we are being very polite, but the situation was hugely complicated. I have a question to Professor Hrycak. Does the memory of Holocaust coincide with the memory of Ukrainian pogroms? Uh, I have heard uh, that people refer to Khmelnytsky as the second Hitler in terms of uh, the pogrom classics. Yes, obviously, yes. The, but uh, if I respond to that question, um, yes, I would be, uh, I could respond in detail, but it would not be relevant for our discussion. Uh, my, our final comment, and we will draw to a close. No other comment that makes our lives easier. Okay, there is a comment. I want to challenge one comment that youth are not interested in the Holocaust. I would argue um, there's a great number of youth, especially American youth, who are interested, um, and I'd like to speak on behalf of those people. And I think the question may be, are we responding to their curiosity in an adequate manner um, in our education system? And just another uh, question that maybe isn't, can't be discussed today, maybe tomorrow. Um, 
what is the purpose of our memory and is it inspiring action for acceptance? Is it teaching our children and our society um, towards actions that are uh, towards acceptance and tolerance? Um, and just, and there was a comment about using human rights along with history and I think that's something that we uh, should consider. So thank you very much. A jeśli, jeśli można... If I may, as a moderator, I can say the following. Memory is a social fact. Now, the question whether we can form or shape it and how we want to form and shape it and to what extent can we form or shape it, that is a question. As a sociologist and anthropologist, yes, well, the social fact is generated by people who talk to one another and produce social facts, so it is a living organism. Should any conclusions be drawn uh, from the history I tried to outline of 70 years of developing European identities, well, one conclusion that could be drawn is one of changeability. These issues and problems were suggested and resolved differently in the 1960s, differently in the 1970s, and differently now. The stage we have hit now it ha carries its own specificity. We do not have the time to discuss it, but very briefly, let me, let me respond. I don't know what your comment was about, but do you negate uh, the existence of anti-Semitism in this country as a certain cultural stratum in the context of what exists in other countries? Obviously, yes, but I do not really know how that argument was to be critical. Maybe it was not critical. If I may, I would like to draw this con conversation to a close. Well, I do believe that uh, Jan Karski's unfinished mission, the entire program, has the uh, purpose of reminding all of us about Jan Karski, but also the entire Polish society in its um, behaviors. Now, with regard to what Jan Gross wrote, were these behaviors typical or not? And if yes, then to what, for what part? of the society, we have a number of publications on the Polish underground state and their attitude to the Holocaust was unambiguous. We could try and answer the question whether they did enough, but I believe that this is important and I also believe that the dialogue we have engaged in serves the purpose of reminding all of us how complicated history is and also what can be done in order to introduce the different shades and different colors and different voices to our discourse. Um, it was. It is not an exercise in relativism, it is not an exercise in escaping blame, but the ultimate purpose is to prove how complicated topics of historic memory are. Thank you very much for participating in our panel.